Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm going to try that one more time. Good morning. Good to see all of you here. It's such a beautiful day. I, I told the earlier service that, you know, we, we are, by the way, in the future. I don't know when, but we will be having a uh, drive-in church again. But we're going to do it because we want to and because it was cool. And, and neat and stuff and beautiful days like this add to that. We're not going to do it because we had to. It really was a neat experience. I have to confess, I kind of miss preaching on that uh, on that trailer with a cowboy hat on. It was kind of cool. So, but we are here. We are glad that you are here with us. We, are, as we begin our worship time this morning, we are joining with churches and Christians around this country, praying today, praying for our our nation and. If there was ever a time when our nation needed prayer, it's now. What I'm going to ask you to do, not just for this morning, but for today and for the time in front of us to be praying for our nation, is to be praying for revival. This nation is where it is right now because this nation has turned its back on God. We need to return to God. We need, as a nation, to turn to God. Uh, not that what is happening is not important and necessary to deal with and tragic and traumatic and everything else. But as a friend of mine said years ago, if you deal, he used to talk about making a priority list of things to do. And on his list would be A things, B things, and C things. C, obviously, A was the most important, B second, C third. And he found after a while that he was getting a whole lot of C's done. And occasionally some B's, but if he didn't take care of the A's, he still wasn't being successful. And if we deal with a lot of C's and B's, although they may be extremely important, and we miss the A, we will still not accomplish what God has called us to do. Sin is sin, and sin needs to be dealt with, and the horizontal won't do much good if we don't start with the vertical. The vertical relationship with God has to be dealt with, and that's where we are as a nation. So as we begin our service in prayer this morning, pray for revival. Pray that we are willing as a people to stand up for Christ and understand that when we do that, how much we will see begin to fall into place. Let's pray. Father, as we come before your throne of grace, we understand that we need to return to you. Father, not just as a nation, but many, you, you, we as your children, as churches, many have found ourselves off in areas and dealing with things that really have nothing to do or, or may seem important at the moment, but in reality are not the most important. And the most important thing is that we as your children are walking with you. That we are sharing your gospel. That we are leading others to walk with you. Father, we will not find ourselves going off wrong paths if we're walking with the Creator. So our prayer now, first of all, is for ourselves. As individuals, as families, as a church family. Father, we pray for Christians around this country. Your word says that if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways then I will hear from on high and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land it has to start with us and father as we seek to return to you and be the people you've called us to be we pray for this nation we pray father that as a nation that we will realize that we must turn to you even if we deal with the important, even if we deal with the traumatic, even if we deal with difficult situations, but if we miss the point of as a nation coming back to you, not that we were ever perfect or ever will be. Only one perfect person has ever walked this earth and that was your son, Jesus Christ. But Father, we can return and we must return to you. Father, we pray for this nation from top to bottom and bottom to top and everywhere in between. May we, Father, may we turn back to you.
do what is necessary that we might take that opportunity and might realize that it it could well be our last. Or may we seize that. May we humbly come back to our God. Father, we love you and we praise you and we thank you for the opportunity to be in this place. May all that we say and do today be about you. May we worship you. May we glorify you, Father. That is our prayer. For it is the precious name of Christ we pray. Amen. First Chronicles 16, 34, we read these words. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. The psalmist says in Psalm 100, Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise, for the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. Let's stand and sing about the everlasting forever love of our Father. Give thanks to the Lord, our God and King. His love endures forever. For He is good, He is above all things. His love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise. With a mighty hand and outstretched arms. His love endures forever. For the light that's been reborn, His love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise, sing praise, sing with us forever, forever. From the rising to the setting sun, His love endures forever. And by the grace of God, we will carry on. His love endures forever. Sing praise. faithful forever God is strong forever God is with us forever forever God is faithful forever God is strong forever God is with us forever Aren't you grateful for our Father who is forever faithful to us? You know, there are over 3,000 scriptures uh, that offer us the promises of God. Psalm 119, 140, I read this morning, says this. Your promises have been thoroughly tested. That is why I love them so much. I don't know about you, but I'm glad that we can stand firm on the promises of our Father and depend on Him. And 
standing on the promises of Christ my King. Through eternal ages let His praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God my Savior. God, standing on the promises that cannot fail, when the howling storms of doubt and fear assail, by the living word of God I shall prevail, standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing, standing. Promises of Christ the Lord, bound to Him eternally by love's strong cord, overcoming daily by the Spirit's sword, standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing, standing. God, standing on the promises I cannot fall, listening every moment to the Spirit's call, resting in my Savior as my all in all, standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing, Standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Amen. One of my favorite promises of God is found in Lamentations chapter 3, verses 22 and 23, where it says, The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast said, thou forever.
That's just one of the many promises. I think we could spend all day naming the promises of God. But I think we all know we have more than 10,000 reasons to bless His holy name for what He's done. That's why the psalmist says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name and forget not all His benefits to us. Declare it, bless the Lord, oh my soul. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before. Oh my soul, I'll worship Your holy name. Worship His holy name. 
that is a perfect segue into what we'll be looking at this morning. I invite you to take your Bibles and turn to the book of Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, we'll be looking at verses 18 through 20 of Philippians chapter 4. Paul is closing out his letter to the Christians in Philippi, and it's been a powerful letter. It's been a positive letter, and he still has encouraging things to say. Beginning of verse 18, Paul says, I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And my God will supply every need of yours according to your riches and glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Father, as we look into your word this morning, as we speak of your glory, remind us your God. You are so far above our comprehension, our understanding, we can't even begin to fathom you. We would know truly nothing really of you had you not reached down to us. But Father, you gave us your Son, you gave us your Word, and your Holy Spirit to guide us. Father, as you speak to us now, may we open our hearts to more and more of you. Of course, in the precious name of Christ, we pray. Amen. 23 years ago, this is May 2020. I don't think any of us are probably going to forget 2020, long as we live. But I, I remember 1997 because 23 years ago, my wife and myself and my children, we were living in Tennessee at the time, serving a church there, and the Baptist and Reflector, which was, or still is actually there, uh, the state Texas, or excuse me, the state Baptist paper came out, and I, I saw a little article, ad, whatever you want to call it in there, from a church in Italy looking for a pastor. I didn't say anything to my wife about it. Thus, mistake number one. But something about it caught my eye, and I decided to send a letter to them. This was back in the day of, of letters. So I sent a letter to them, and one thing kind of led to another, and eventually I had to tell my wife. I survived that, barely. But 23 years ago today, about this time, we found ourselves after a six-month time frame, give or take, preparing to move. Here we had spent this time about 50 miles from my wife's family. My, my children, Cody, was about seven. Cameron was barely 18 months old. They'd spent that time close to their grandma and grandpa and, and Cherie closer to her parents than she had been in our ministry at that time. But that was all coming to an end. We were packing things up. We were selling things. And I remember the time would come later in the summer when we would take what we had that we hadn't shipped and hadn't sold, and we would put it in these eight big bags. And we went and got on an airplane. And we took that flight to Amsterdam, and then we changed flights and took that flight to Venice, approximately 13 hours worth of being on airplanes. We got off and hadn't slept much, really at all. Heading to a new place that I knew nothing about, there were three gentlemen in a big white van that came to pick us up from the church. They were all Air Force because it was an Air Force community that we were going to. Remember, we threw everything into the back of that van and we drove. And, and I, I, part of me realized I was in Italy, but part of me didn't. You know how it is after that many hours on an airplane. 
We eventually drove up to a house in this little community of Aviano that I'd never seen. And there was a car sitting out in the, par- in, the, in the drive area that I was told was ours. We walked into the house and there were things stored up all over the place. There were things in the kitchen. There, there were, were groceries and so forth. And there was a crock pot with a roast in it cooking. So you could smell the roast throughout the house. And I looked around at some of the things, and and I noticed that in the corner from the floor to the ceiling was literally stacked cases of Dr. Pepper. And as we went through, I know my wife and my children were were dog tired, but I went around and looked through at all this stuff that they had provided for us to make us feel at home. In fact, it would be about six months before we would really realize everything that was there because you you would start thinking you needed something and you would open up a cabinet and lo and behold, there it would be. I mean, they had gone through and seen to it that everything that we could possibly imagine we would ever need was there. Trying to make us feel at home and they did such an amazing job. Here we were in an overwhelming situation And we were met by an overwhelming experience, and that overwhelming experience was overwhelming generosity. We've been talking about the five solas of the Reformation for quite a while. The five onlys or loans, if you will. Scripture, faith, grace, Christ. We've been talking about glory, specifically the glory of God now for quite a while. And one of the things that we have seen is that that word glory can mean different things in relationship to God based on the context it's used in. So context means everything. And here Paul is wrapping up his letter to the Christians in Philippi. And they they are such special people to him. And he uses that word glory. And glory often refers to different elements of the character of God. Here it refers to generosity. Both the generosity of God... And how that character trait works its way into and through the fabric of the children of God. One of the things he tells us is that generosity is an offering to God. Generosity is an offering to God. Look at verse 18. He speaks of this. He speaks of a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. All the language that he uses here. It is taken from worship. Remember who Paul was. Paul was a Christian now. He was one of the apostles, the least of the apostles, as he would refer to himself. But, but Paul had been a Pharisee. He was a priest. And so he understood worship. And he's taking language from worship. And Paul regarded what he had received from the Philippians as worship. Not only that, he refers to it as a, frag- as a fragrant offering. If you look back in the Old Testament, you read about something called a thank offering. It was often referred to as an incense offering. Therefore, the term fragrant offering offering. So Paul looks at this and to him, what they have given him, their generosity has been an offering, a thank offering, a fragrant offering to God. Now, when you look to the Old Testament, you tend to see sacrificial language. Paul sees their offering as a sacrificial act of worship. Now, we look in the New Testament and we tend to look at that a little differently. Understand when Paul's writing, there is no New Testament. Paul's writing, there is no Old Testament. There's simply the Word of God and, and, and they, what they dealt with was the Old Testament. And you were dealing with sacrifice. You were dealing with, with animals being sacrificed. But in the New Testament, we're talking about covenant believers, which is what we are. And it's a little different. Now, having said that, he's not talking about a sacrifice of atonement here. Because no one can make atonement for sin but Jesus Christ. So that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about a sacrifice of acknowledgement that is well-pleasing to God. He's talking about the fruit of their grace to God as they meet the needs of Paul. In fact, he uses that phrase, pleasing to God. God was well-pleased with what they did. It was an acceptable Christian sacrifice. You know, there are times that physical activity can become a spiritual 
or can become spiritual in motivation and importance. Back in Romans chapter 12, Paul talked about this. That's why he said in verse 1, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. He was talking about dedicating ourselves to God and that dedication of our lives being a spiritual act. You know, when we, when we go on mission trips and we go to to do vacation Bible school or whatever it is, wherever we go. We're, 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 we're being generous. We're giving. It's a spiritual sacrifice. When we, when we go to help a church put up a building or we go to help do rebuilding after a storm or a disaster, when you go on disaster relief, you know, just the other, a couple days ago, I sent out some information that came in through the Southern Baptist Convention about people going to buoy. Because of the storms there and the different things that are needed there. When, when we do those kind of things, when we take food to people that are in need, when we pick up groceries, when we pick other things up for folks, especially with what's been going on here recently, when you go out and mow a yard, when you do these things and you're doing them because God has motivated you to do it, even though you're doing it for someone else, you're doing what Paul said the Christians in Philippi did. You're sacrificing to God. You are, you are being generous. It is an offering to God. We sometimes use the word benevolence. That's what that is. And you know what's really interesting? There's so many times that, that we, we meet needs, you know. Sometimes it's through a, <coughs> excuse me, sometimes it's through a clothes closet or food pantry or an offering or something along those lines. But we, <coughs> excuse me, we, we meet needs, we, we, we deal with areas, you deal with people that you will never see. People that maybe in this life, you never actually meet. And so what was given to Paul, to Paul's needs was actually being sacrificed to God himself. And so it gave it a greater worth, a higher significance when you see that your offering is going to God. That's what he was talking about. <coughs> Excuse me. That's how you glorify God. Generosity, Paul says, is an offering to God. Not only that, generosity makes kingdom work possible. Look at verse 18 again. I've received full payment and more, he says. Now, don't, don't take that word full payment as if there was some kind of debt. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about support for ministry. I receive full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent. Epaphroditus was apparently someone that was kind of a go-between guy between the church in Philippi and, and, and Paul. He's saying, I have all I want and all I desire, and, 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 and I, I desire no more. I have everything I need. We, we, we live in a day and time when for many people it is very difficult to know the difference between needs and wants. Um, I, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar, you know what, what's going on the last few months. A lot of uh, stores, a lot of businesses have been affected, uh, whether they be clothing stores or, or restaurants or whatever. Uh, some of those restaurants and some of those stores and so forth apparently are unfortunately not just closed for the virus effects, but it appears that some of them now are going to be closed permanently. Uh, I don't know how this works when it comes to some that are owned by corporates and then they have others that are owned by franchisees and so forth. But I noticed the other day that Golden Corral has announced that they're closing all their corporate stores permanently. Now, apparently that's not that many. I don't know if it affects the one here or not. But Golden Corral, when it first started out, it was kind of known as a, as a steak place, I guess. It was a family place. But then they eventually became a, a buffet place. Now, buffets and Baptist and Sunday, that can be a frightening thing. Now, uh, personally, I grew up in the days of Wyatt's Cafeteria. Anybody want to admit you remember Wyatt's? All right, some of you do. Good. I don't feel so old then. You know, here's the deal. Uh, you know, you go to a buffet and now I, I, I'm a big guy, but I want to tell you something. I really don't eat that much. So I go to buffet and all this stuff's laid out and I get this plate and I come and sit down and then I eat and all of a sudden I'm full. 
I mean, I look up and there's just all this other stuff. I am literally wasting. They are making money off me because I just don't go back. I just can't do it. I, it doesn't matter how much is laid out before me. I realize I'm stuffed to the gills. Now, in a sense, that's what Paul is saying here. He says, when he says, I've received everything, I, I am full, I have enough. In fact, this is a strong expression denoting that nothing was lacking. He says, I am well supplied. It means to have an abundance, to have an excess, to have more than enough, to be filled up completely. Paul was overwhelmed by their generosity. In fact, so much so, let me share with you out of uh, out of 2 Corinthians chapter 8, because there Paul talks about that. In, in verse 1, he's, he's talking to the Corinthians about these folks. He says, We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia, of which Philippi was, was a part. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, and as I can testify excuse me, testify, and beyond their means of their own free will, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. And this, not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. Now, a couple of things here. Number one, they gave themselves. There's that generosity. First, not just a matter of what they were giving, but they gave themselves. They, you know, Paul talked in Romans 12 about you know, giving oneself as a sacrifice to God. That's what he's talking about. But secondly, they gave from their rock bottom poverty. In other words, they didn't have it to give. Paul, I can picture Paul saying to them, you know what, you can't really spare this. And they begged him for the ability to do this. I, I want to share something with you. This is not to, and not intended to make heads swell, but this is just a fact. My wife and I have been married 37 years. I've been in ministry for 38 years. And I can tell you that I have never come across a church as generous as this church. And I'm going to give you one example. And it's, we're closing out the Annie Armstrong Easter offering today. I remember when I first came uh, eight years ago, the offering back then for Annie Armstrong, which is, is the offering for the North American missions of the Southern Baptist Convention, um, was, I, I, I don't even remember that there was a goal. The offering was somewhere around 1,000, 1,500, something like that. That has continued to grow to the point to where last year, our goal was $12,000. And you matched that. You, you went over that. Now, that was 2019. Let's go into 2020. Now, and I have to lay out just a little something for you. See, years ago, somebody much wiser than I in the Southern Baptist Convention decided, you know what? We're not going to call it the Annie Armstrong Easter offering anymore. We're just going to call it the Annie Armstrong offering. And we're going to set it up in March, period, because Easter moves. Most of the time it's in April, but sometimes it's in March. And so we're going to set it up in March. And, and, and I just could never bring myself to do that. I always felt like it was connected to Easter. And so I, I, being the rebellious person I am, I said, you know what? We're going to have the Annie Armstrong Easter offering, and it's going to be when Easter is. So 2020, it was going to be in April. Well, we were planning for that and looking at goals and talking with the, with the Mountain Moving Missions team. And, and as we talked, we determined that that giving was getting a little tougher in certain situations. So we decided originally that our goal was not going to be as high as our giving had been last year because there was some things we just felt maybe we should reduce it a little bit. Well, of course, then came the virus. We didn't have service here in April, but we were going to have that offering. So we moved the offering to May. And then at the point, it's like, you know what, man, do you even really want to put a goal on this? Because now you don't know what's going to happen. And so we decided the goal would be your best offering, your best gift. You know, when you say something like that, man, you can go all kinds of directions with that. It's a pretty safe thing to do. And we, so we put it on everything. We prayed and we went on. Now, I share that with you to tell you that before today, before today, this church has given more to the Annie Armstrong Easter offering than it gave last year. 
which means it's the most this church has ever given, ever, to the Annie Armstrong Easter offering. Now, again, I'm not, I'm not sharing that to blow anyone's head up or necessarily pat on the back. But what I'm saying is, is that when you're involved in God's kingdom work, whether it's in North America or it's in Texas or it's internationally or whatever, our giving, meeting needs of someone down the street in the next community, God has ways of using that generosity glorifies God. Generosity makes kingdom work possible. And, and so then Paul shares this in this context, verse 19. By the way, we love to pull verse 19 here out of context. Please understand that verse 19 is within the context of this generosity of God. Then Paul says, and my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. In other words, he wasn't making a guarantee of something personal. He was talking about God providing for kingdom-oriented work. Whatever we need, when we're generous, as God had provided for him, he said, you know what? God has ways of providing for us to do his work. My God, he says, the same God, the same source who provided through you to me, my God is going to continue to provide every need. There will not be a need unmet that you have to reach out, in the, to reach out with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And what's neat is, he says, this is going to be according to his riches. Not, not according to their need, not out of his riches, but according to his riches. The supply, he says, is going to be suited to the resource. Let me put it this way. You know, we, we, we talk about pie charts. Well, I, I want to talk about pie, okay? Not, not the number pie. I want to talk about pie. I want to talk about coconut cream pie or pecan or whatever. I like coconut cream, okay? There, there's a pie, and, and you can slice that pie. Now, you can slice it however many slices you want. There's only so much pie. So, sadly, when you run out of pie, you're out of pie. And there are times that people tend to look, I think, at God that way. Paul says, don't look at God that way. You know what? His pie never runs out. Because his supplies to you are not based on something we picture. His supplies to us to do his work are based on him. In fact, he says it's consistent with his, quote, glory. According to his riches in glory. God's generosity. And how do we know it's his generosity? According to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. There is no greater example of the generosity of God than giving his son, Jesus Christ. That's glory. That's glory. Generosity is an offering to God. Generosity makes kingdom work possible. And then Paul tells us that generosity, generosity is forever. Look at verse 20. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. To our God. He started off by saying in verse 19, my God. But now he says, to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Here, let, let me tell you what. There's two things here. There's, there's what this is and what it means. What it is, is this is a doxology. Now, I know you've heard that word. You probably sang the doxology. I'll, I'll even talk about that later. But the word doxology comes, generally it comes at the end of something, okay? It, it, it comes from two Greek words. One means glory and the other means word. So a doxology is a word of glory, a glorious word about God. Paul, when you read other writings of Paul, Paul breaks out in doxologies in all kinds of crazy places. You normally put a doxology at the end of the letter. Paul's not done. But he breaks out in this. He breaks out in it when he considers all that God has blessed him with in his generosity. So first of all, this is a doxology. But secondly, it captures the idea of the age to come. Because again, remember, Paul's a Hebrew. And for the Hebrews, they not only looked at how God blessed them right now, but what that meant about what was to come. So, to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. If you... We're going to go back to my office. I, I, I want to let you know something. I, I, did, I did something that I haven't done in a long time. During the end of March, especially through April, when we were not able to have services here, when we were doing online stuff and so forth, I was really lost. 
And as a pastor, I was lost. You know, I couldn't go to hospitals. And of course, still the protocols don't really allow that unless you're a family. And right now, as far as I know, it's still one family member. I couldn't go to hospitals, couldn't go to visit folks and so forth. And so I would come to the office and I looked at my office and I thought, you know, I probably really ought to clean this thing. You know, I, I know that's a, you know, my, you know, my wife was cleaning. My, my home has never been as clean as it is right now. It's incredible. My, my office, I looked and I thought, you know, I really ought to clean my office. I mean, there, there's, there's some dust bunnies that haven't moved for years. And, and so I really need to do something about this. So I got in there and I cleaned it out. And I, I, I did away with a lot of old training magazines for 20 and 30 years ago and stuff like that. Pulled that out. Now, if you walk in my office, you may look and say, well, what did he get rid of? You know, because it looks like it's still the same. But trust me, I hauled out three huge bags of stuff out of there. Now, if you look in my office, though, and there, there's a lot of stuff in there that people have given me over the years. Some of those things are books that have meant a great deal to me and continue to provide for my ministry. Uh, there, there are things in there that are they're, they're very special to me. There, there are a lot of John Wayne things in there. In fact, when you walk in my office, John Wayne is standing there staring you down. I mean, it's just one of those things. I'm, I'm sorry, it's the way it is. But if you walk in there, you will see some things. Some things will make sense. I understand why he has this here. It was probably because he was there and so forth and this, that, and the other. But there, there will be some things that you will see that you will wonder, why in the world? And it will mean nothing to you. But it will mean the world to me. Because there are things there that people gave to me and it had nothing to do with the material wealth of the particular thing. It wasn't that it provided a meal for me. It didn't pay a bill. It didn't provide a vehicle or whatever. But those particular things were things that people gave me at a particular time in my life when I was down in the valley and they helped pick me up and keep going. And to this day, I can look at those things. To this day, I can still pick those things up and I could still be in a valley and they'll still pick me up. Because they mean that much to me. Here's Paul. He's thinking about, it's not just the fact that the gifts that he has been given, you know, fed him or clothed him or whatever. But these things were far beyond material. It was the spirit in which they had been given. It was a dimension of worship and true Christian giving. Their gifts were an outpouring of themselves. We give glory to God. When we remember how he has blessed us. When, when, when we stop and think about our salvation, our forgiveness, grace, we ought to give glory to God. We, we, because it all points, it's not just about now, it points to the future because he's going to bless us again. That's why he said in John chapter 14, he said, look, Jesus said, I've done all this stuff. You know why? Because I'm coming back. It points to the future. And the ultimate purpose in life then is to bring glory to God forever. Generosity. Tim Keller is a pastor and writer. One of his more recent books, he talks about the Beatitudes, one in particular you know, the, the Beatitudes, the, the Blesseds, if you will, the beginning of chapter 5 of Matthew and the beginning of Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Poor in spirit. A lot of people today who resist teaching about the idea of, of spiritual poverty. And then he goes on to say, and, and I, I, I think he's correct, Way too often, and when, when I, I, I use this phrase, the, the average Christian, however you want to define that, the average Christian tends to believe that God owes us certain things, that, that he ought to answer our prayers and to bless us for all the many good things we've done. Poor in spirit, he says, no, no, not really poor in spirit. The average Christian tends to look at things more like a, more like middle class in spirit. We, 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 it's almost like we feel like we've earned a certain standing with God through our, through our hard work. We, maybe we believe that our success or the resources that we have are primarily due to our own in, industry, our own energy. 
But then there's that poor in spirit. Because you know what that really means? It means that you are deeply in debt before God. And you have absolutely no ability to even begin to redeem yourself. And that God's free generosity to you came to him at an infinite cost. His son, Jesus Christ. But it was the only thing that would save you and me. Doxology. <laughs> Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Does thinking about your God make you want to do that? It should. Because that is how you glorify God. Father, we cannot even begin to fathom your generosity. The generosity that would lead you to provide through your son the only way, the only way we could possibly come before your throne of grace. How precious your generosity is. That is part of your glory. God, we pray that, we pray that as your children, that glory would resonate through us, that it would well up within us, that, Father, we would demonstrate it, that we would exercise it, that we would live it. Because there's so many people that need to understand through our actions, through our lives, that your ultimate generosity provides for their salvation as well as ours. Father, I pray that those of us who have a personal relationship with you, that we would come to understand that as much as your character needs to be revealed through us, that that only happens when we walk with you. Father, we need to walk with you every day, spend more time with you in prayer, more time in your word, more time allowing your spirit to work through us. Learning to be generous. Because when we're generous, when we, when we give to you by giving to others, when we serve you by serving others, you never, you never fail to provide all that we need and more to make that happen. You want others to see you. Father, may we be the children you've called us to be. May we allow you to have total access, total control in our lives by our total surrender. And may we learn what it means to be generous. Father, for those here this morning who do not know Christ, Oh, how they need to know that generosity. How they need to know your son. How they need to understand that there is nothing in the world that they could ever possibly do that in any way would rate being justified in your presence. Only because of your love and the generosity that stems from it. Father, I pray for those here today who do not know Christ. I pray that they will not leave this place without coming to me or Gara or Tim or Sam or Rob or someone else. There's so many here that would be more than willing to tell them about what it means to know our generous creator, the one who not only gave us life, but sent his son that we might not only have life, life eternally but life more abundantly Lord we love you we praise you 
And we thank you, Father, for your glorious generosity. For it's in the precious name of Christ we pray. Amen. As we prepare to leave today, let's stand and give praise to our God for his forever faithful love to us. Give thanks to the Lord our God and King. His love endures forever. For he is good, he is above all things. His love endures forever. Sing praise. Sing praise. Sing praise. See you next week.